Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, as we have normally commenced with the recitation of the Quran, I feel it appropriate for purposes of barakah to commence with a short recitation from the Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذابا ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عباده الذين اصطفى وبعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and all his companions and every one of us and our offspring to come up to the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast on this deen and may he make us from amongst the blessed and those who are chosen. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant us knowledge that is beneficial and we ask you to benefit us from the knowledge you have granted us. Ya Allah, we do not have knowledge besides that which you have granted us. For indeed, you are the owner of knowledge all wise. Ya Allah, we seek your protection from knowledge that will not be made use of, from eyes that will not cry for your sake, from a heart that will not tremble in your fear, from a stomach or a soul that will never be filled or content, and from a prayer that is made that will never be answered. Ameen. Honored scholars of deen, brothers and sisters in Islam, once again I find myself here at this RIS conference, revival of the Islamic spirit this year with the theme, striking the balance. The opening talk, inshallah, I make dua or I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let it be as simple as possible yet Effective enough to change my life to begin with and then everybody else's. I mean Naturally, it is such a broad topic That it can be discussed from many angles Sitting here a few moments ago Listening to the melodious recitation of the Qari who read for us. I Jotted down a few points that came to my mind And I wish to share them together with other points that I had jotted down previously and naturally, when we are speaking to scholars and when we are speaking to students, we need to jot down points. I think many of the brothers and sisters are not used to seeing me with a piece of paper, but it is only correct for us 
to have a few points written down so that we can follow the topic correctly. We have limited time and inshallah, I commence by saying this deen itself is a balance. Islam is a balance. There are people who do not follow any religion at all. They are free. They do what they want. They, they literally behave even worse than animals on one hand. And on the other hand, you have, notice I'm pointing there, meaning at the wall, not at anyone in particular, inshallah. On the other hand, you have people who have restricted their lives to the degree that they don't marry, they don't engage in anything worldly, they have dedicated their lives to what they believe is the correct and upright worship, and at times not even to the Creator, but they have imposed on themselves rules of celibacy and various other rules that have made them people who have forgotten the fact that they are living in a world. Islam has come in the center, balanced. Neither do we behave like hooligans, not following anything, nor are we from amongst those who divorce ourselves from this world. However, as the verses were read regarding Qarun and what he was told, and that of this particular worldly life that will be of benefit to you, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, go forth, try obviously, and this is for all of us, to get as close as you can to your creator, go forth to earn the Jannah, the Akhirah, that is the Darul Akhirah that is mentioned there. Don't forget that there is a life after death, there is accountability, but at the same time, remember you are in this world. So don't forget the little portion of this world and the worldly life and the earnings of this world within the limits of the creator. That's a powerful message. What happened to Qarun? He was from amongst those who was one-sided. He didn't strike a balance. He was so involved in the dunya, he was so involved in the worldly material life that he earned and earned more than he could spend. So much that the Quran says that the keys to his treasures were so heavy that a group of men would find it quite difficult to actually carry only the keys. Today, mashallah, we've got one card and we get excited. Subhanallah. At that time, imagine what type of treasure he had. And yet Allah says he didn't have anything. He was destroyed. He had prepared himself for this life which was coming to an end and which came to an end very quickly for him. But he did not prepare for the eternal life. In Islam, as Muslimin, we have this life and to strike the balance, we have the life after death. And in the same way that we prepare for this life, and I normally tell university students that if you've spent four years, three years or more or less studying books for the purposes of success in the dunya or in this worldly life, we will not say you are wrong. But ask yourself, this will only help me for another 25 years, possibly 30, a little bit more, maybe less. What have I done for the eternal life that will commence at that point and last forever? Forever. Subhanallah. This afternoon I spoke about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part of what I had said is time is a creature of Allah. Time is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember when we get into paradise, a billion years later, if I were to ask you how many years left, you would actually have to say what? That question doesn't apply. Here it is khalidina fiha abada. It is forever and ever. You don't age, there's no time and so on. So it's important for us to know that as Muslimin, we already have a balance. However, we know the Quran says, La ikaraha fi deen. There is no compulsion when it comes to entry into faith. No one forced us to be Muslimin. You choose to enter Islam. Once you enter Islam, you have chosen to limit your freedom as understood by the secular world. I hope we understand this. 
So when we become Muslimin, we are automatically surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Creator, and we are automatically giving up some of what the secular world might consider a freedom that you enjoy. For example, your dress code has to be within a certain framework. Not because we are not free as human beings, but through our freedom, we have chosen to be Muslimin. Hence, we have chosen to give up some of what the secular world might have given us. And I hope we understand what I've just said. So no Muslim can say, I'm a Muslim, but the Islam I follow, I'm free to do what I want in it. Well, that then would not be Islam because Islam is al-istislamu lillah, is to surrender to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and what he has sent down. And we are fortunate, we are fortunate that Allah Almighty has struck the balance for us. Amazing. Moments ago, I was sitting here with a friend of mine and every day in the evening we update a Facebook status for purposes of da'wah. And we did it a few moments ago. And I thought to myself, what should we say? In one sentence, we want to cap the whole topic. Let's give it. And I said, Allah Almighty has struck the balance for us. In what way? Simple. By making our needs acts of worship if they are done with the correct intentions. Subhanallah. Imagine if I want to be a pious person in Islam, I don't need to sit in Salah 24 hours of the day and sit with the Mus'haf, the Quran, and, and read 24 hours of the day and fast every single day. No. Even whilst I am eating, if I have the correct intentions, I am earning reward. It is an act of worship to eat in Islam. Subhanallah. Look at the balance struck by the Creator. If it wasn't for that, how would we be able to, you know, continue with our day-to-day -day lives? Subhanallah. So it's amazing. When I eat, I can earn a reward. If I have the correct intention and I eat correctly, and I try my best to learn as much as possible of what Islam teaches me regarding my diet and how I should eat, when I should eat, what I should eat, and so on, Naturally, there are things that are haram. We will abstain from that which is totally prohibited. But there are other things that are not haram. And they might not be farad either. But they are teachings of the Prophet. May peace be upon him. If we are to follow those teachings, not only will it benefit our own health, but naturally we will be earning a reward for it. We speak nowadays about the benefits of honey, raw honey, the benefits of olive oil from a medical perspective the benefit of cider vinegar, the benefit of various other items. Subhanallah, when we had made mention of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a long, long time back, people did not take it as seriously as when the doctor tells you, listen brother, listen sister, you know, this will help you a lot. You need to now use a bit of cider vinegar or some vinegar or a little bit of olive oil. Subhanallah, we pay a doctor to tell that to us, mashallah. But Islam says, try and learn what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has taught, put it into practice with the correct intention, you earn a reward for it, subhanallah. Similarly, looking after your own children, what is that? One might say, well, it's nature, it's natural, part of what is nature, mashallah. But Islam strikes the balance for us, saying, do it correctly with the correct intentions. We make it an act of worship for you. Bearing a child, a woman in pregnancy, subhanallah, she will handle the child or she will carry the child as the Quran says. The mother has carried the child, if I can use the interpretation, being imposed on her. And she delivered it also involuntarily, which means she had to give birth, subhanallah. But that is such a high status in the deen and in the sharia and from the lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Imagine, it is an act of worship to have children, subhanallah. To get married is an act of worship. An act of worship, amazing. Look at how the balance is struck. Neither should a person be from amongst those who believe in celibacy, nor should a person be from amongst those who is polygamous beyond the limits, but rather to marry within one's means and capacity, 
and adopt and obey the law of the Almighty in the process makes that person so pious that the hadith says khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi the best from amongst you are those who are best to your spouse your family members amazing so look at how to be good to your family members is an act of worship and this is why we say like Sheikh Ibrahim mentioned moments ago a man with a big beard not necessarily is a brilliant Muslim and in the same way, a man without a beard, not necessarily a bad Muslim. And I'd like to speak about the sisters as well. A woman in full niqab, for example, is not necessarily a brilliant Muslim inside there. And a woman, for example, who might not be dressed that appropriately, may not be a bad Muslim inside there. So we do not judge. Allah says, leave that for us. And this is why, amazingly, we as Muslimin are taught that to assist one another, to give what we call da'wah to one another, to give da'wah even to those who are totally outside the fold of the deen is considered an act of worship. What a balance. And this is why very far from Islam are those who teach us to kill the non-Muslims sporadically. That is unacceptable un-Islamic it has nothing to do with Islam la min qareebin wa la min ba'id neither from near nor from a distance because that is mahallu da'wah those are the people we are trying to invite towards the entry into Islam showing them the goodness of Islam it has been made an act of worship to invite them to Islam how then would it be correct for us to eradicate them when without them we probably wouldn't have the scope of people uttering the shahada may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the balance so this is why it's extremely important for us to know as a gift is the fact that we are Muslim if you take a look at statistics even on the internet from Muslim websites you will come to know or to note that Islam is one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing religion. Amongst whom? A lot of them are those who are fed up. Fed up with what they've been doing all along. The freedom that they've had has made them fed up because that is not freedom. Freedom is actually something that Islam says is governed. And I like to give the example of a motor vehicle. We are free to drive once you have a license. But are you free to bump into the next vehicle? The answer is no. There must be a balance. You drive, mashallah, but without bashing into another vehicle. If you do, you are responsible. You can't say, well, it was my freedom. I was free to bash into your car. This is what the non-Muslims seem to be doing sometimes to Islam. Where they say we are free and using the word freedom, they begin to bash into the Muslims and Islam saying I'm free. Well, in the same way we have speed traps on the M1 and the roads, we need to have speed traps spiritually and religiously. But who is going to govern those? It's common sense. Islam strikes the balance by saying, Amazing verses of the Quran. Allah says, Do not swear or mock or jeer at those who are calling out to gods besides Allah. Even though we don't believe in them, we might regard them funny, we might regard them foolish, but Allah says, Do not mock because they will then mock in return. Look at the balance. Look at the balance. When we lose this balance, we lose everything. This is when chaos spreads across the globe. What would we achieve by burning a Bible, knowing that that Bible has been changed? Even the Christians agree that it's changed. I had a few Christians who came to my home some time back, and I welcomed them. And I asked them one question, and that was it. What was the question? I said, look, my beloved brother, in humanity, obviously, you have a book. You are coming to me to preach the book. I have a book. My book is the Quran. All the Muslims on the globe agree that this is the one book. No change, not even with a letter. Everyone agrees. This is the book, the Quran. Can I ask you, in Christianity, 
Do all the Christians agree that this is the book? He says, no. How many versions of the book are there? He says, well, quite a few. I said, look, beyond 36 versions. The last I knew was 36. So I'd like you to go back to your people and have a huge international conference. Come up amongst the Christians with one book, then bring it to us, inshallah, we will be ready to talk by that time. Subhanallah. We know as Muslims that the, the Bible, they themselves will agree that we don't agree with one another as to the authenticity of the book that the other has in his hand. We are taught, don't ever desecrate that book. Don't burn it. Don't do anything to disrespect it because then it will create chaos and havoc. Islam has struck the balance. But when people do not have that gift of Islam, they don't understand that balance, so they begin to desecrate the Qur'an and they begin to abuse that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid is very lofty in creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We would never do that with Isa or with Jesus, may peace be upon him, nor would we do it with anyone else. And this is why we say we are fortunate to be Muslimin. We have laws that govern us, we have breaks, we have limits. And it is these limits that keep us, subhanallah, on course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled within every one of us a base desire. That base desire should not be fulfilled in a manner that we begin to commit adultery and fornicate. No. Allah says, hang on, there is a way and I've made it so easy. And you should get married so that everyone knows you are married. You need to have some witnesses, you need to have someone Meaning there are certain laws governing the, the method of marriage, which is extremely simple in the Sharia, but you do it in a specific way. You will be responsible for any female you have tampered with. Because in the Sharia, we, there is no tampering with females. You either take her in nikah or you respect her, leave her alone. She is a chaste woman. She is your Muslim sister. Whereas we have others who have no balance. Conjugal desires. Na'udhu billah. I was reading an article on the net where they are considering or some groups are beginning to lobby the permissibility of bestiality. Allah safeguard us. In the same way that homosexuality was discussed several decades back and everybody considered it taboo and foolish. Ma'roofu zamanina munkaru zamanin qad mada. Wa munkaru zamanina sayakunu ma'roofu zamanin sayati. What we consider today, nothing wrong with, people of some time back considered it very bad, taboo. And what we consider taboo today, there will come a time when people in the future will consider it, nothing wrong with. Allahu Akbar. I can't imagine my grandmother with genes, subhanallah. But I can imagine my generation, my wife or my daughter and so on with genes, I can. I think I've just put it into perspective. Things change over time. Remember, this is not a comment for or against genes. No. It's just showing you really that what was considered a long time ago, something that was taboo. Now, we nothing wrong with it. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. So, times change. Islam is so beautiful, the balance it has struck. Certain items, it has just given us a framework. It is not specified because it changes with the changing of time. Let me give you a simple example. You take a look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherein he mentions the happiness of this dunya and what a person would have in order to be considered very, very fortunate and so on. And there are a few items which are mentioned. One of them is al-markab al-murih. He says, a very comfortable conveyance. Imagine if he said a camel like mine. Hey, the story was over. The story was over. But look at the prophetic words. It is a balance. Because today... Even the Datsun 120 Ys we had in 1960 are no longer comfortable. MashaAllah. Imagine. The shocks of the BMW are now what we are looking for. Yes. These are the prophetic balanced words. Look at what he says. Al-Baytul Wasi'ah. He says, a, a spacious home. Because at that time, one little room was considered extremely spacious. But the balance of Islam is such that today... Even if we have two, three, four, ten en suites. You know what's an en suite? At that time, they had the loo was the furthest away. The loo was the furthest away. You had to leave the home, cross the road and use the loo. Today, closer than your bed is the loo. Allahu Akbar. Allah safeguard us. We're not saying it's right or wrong. That's not the discussion. But 
Look at the balance of words. These are prophetic words that will last up to Qiyamah. Subhanallah. So the homes change. Look at another one. He says, Al-Mar'atu Saliha or Zawju Salih. A pious or a good spouse. What is considered good and pious today? Yes, mashallah, with all respect to everyone, mashallah, is nowhere near what was pious at that time. Not even in the least. But the beautiful words are such that we are taught, try and look for a spouse on your level or slightly higher religiously, always. Because it will help you instead of looking for someone lower. Unless obviously you would like to teach them and so on. That's a discussion on its own. It's not today's topic. So this is the balance. We also have, subhanallah, other matters or other issues or other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has created in a balance. Let's take a look at the shade that we have from the sun. If it wasn't for the heat of the sun, would we ever know the value of the shade? If it wasn't for cold, would we ever know what heat is? If it wasn't for heat, would we ever know what cold is? Amazing. Look at how Allah has created it. If it wasn't for night, would we ever know what day is? The verses were read. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمُ اللَّيْلَ سَرْمَدًا إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ إِلَاهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ Subhanallah. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if the night was kept for you, Everlasting, up to Qiyamah, without day, who from those gods besides Allah would bring forth the day for you? Amazing. Do you not hear the Quran says? Do you not hear? So even the balance of the day and night is a balance. It's amazing. That's Allah. And that's the Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this point dawned when the Qari was reading the verses. Amazing. Because without that, all creatures amazingly are created in a balance. We as Muslimin, as insan, sadly do not follow at times that balance and this is where we fail. Now one might say, well, and this is a question that one youngster did ask me. He says, you know, we're talking of the balance. So you get people who are pious and you get those who are not. We must be in the middle, meaning give up a few things and you know, there's a few things that we might engage in and not engage in. No, that is not what is meant by the balance. In Islam, we have a ladder. And I explained this even the last time I attended the same conference. There is a ladder. That ladder has many steps. The top is perfection. None of us will get there. But the bottom, we need to start with step one and move closer and closer to the Almighty. As the days pass, we become better people. And I've given the example of clothing of women folk, for example, in the past. And I have said and I repeat it again. If there is a sister, for example, who is used to miniskirts in her life, the day she drops that mini... Well, what I mean by drop is something else. <laughs> the day she lowers from where, from the point to the knee and makes it a midi skirt, Wallahi, what will we say? She, within her heart, depending on her intention, may have solved either 25 or 50 percent of the problem, depending on what amount of her leg she's now covered. <laughs> Sorry for giving this example, but it's practical. And after that, if she has to put on, and look, she has achieved something, she's achieved something, because I've seen Muslim brothers and sisters whom others might consider far from the fold of Islam, yet their struggle is far greater than those who might be proper Muslims apparently. And why I say this as a teacher, we have in the classroom those who are intelligent, they always first. And you have those who are normally last. But sometimes a child who was 30th in a class of 30, who has worked so hard to get to 20, I would say deserves a bigger prize than the one who was in first position and remained in first position. That's what I would feel. So the struggle, only they would know. And this is why we say, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Al-Imanu bayn al-Khawfi wal raja Iman and belief, according to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the correct balance between fear and hope. 
We hope for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same moment, we fear the punishment of Allah. And what I've noticed from my experience nowadays on the globe, when we are public speakers, yes, we do need to speak of the doom that is to come. That happens and we must. And everybody needs to know about Jahannam. But I feel that nowadays on the globe, there are a larger number or there is a larger number of people turning towards goodness through hope than through fear nowadays. I may be wrong, but this is what I feel. Because it's a free world out there. There are Muslimin who may turn away from Islam when we make them feel like they are non-Muslim already by talking to them. So sister or brother, you are going to Jahannam. Have you heard that? Hellfire. He says, well, I'm already there. I'd rather open the bottle now. So he starts drinking. And I'm already there. I'd rather do this. That is because there is no balance. But when we strike the balance, we will be able to and definitely be able to walk on a path of the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala getting closer to Allah on a daily basis. And this is why I say there will come a time when that sister has now covered herself, possibly not in the best of material and maybe not in the loosest of clothing, but she has now arrived at a bare minimum, maybe step number five. And there are still another hundred steps, but she is far better off than she was when she was off the ladder totally. Allahu Akbar. And then she gets on the ladder and she moves further. And then you suddenly have one of the pious people, you know, outwardly pious. May Allah grant us hikmah and wisdom in da'wah. You have a person who comes and condemns and says, you know what, sister, don't bother. You're going to hell. Every hair that is showing is in the fire. Yes. So the sister starts saying, what? But remember, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. People are ignorant. They don't know your struggle within you. They don't know it. They don't have a clue. For as long as you are heading in the right direction, persevere, continue, and you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your doors. But with that balance, if you are to fall on one of either side, you may lose the balance. Let me explain. Someone is, for example, believing in a lot of hope. They have hope in the mercy of Allah with no fear at all. That person might end up sinning because they will think, well, you know what? Allah will forgive me. I heard that hadith. That hadith, I heard it. And I heard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive everyone. So what happened? The person begins to think, let me sin. Allah will forgive. Let me then sin. Allah will forgive. There is a verse in the Quran. وَلَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Oh, danger. Tawbah is not for the one who continues committing sin intentionally. Then when death is overtaking them, they begin to say, I seek forgiveness now. Because then it's too late. Look at what happened to Fir'aun. He was given so many chances. At the end, Allah says, do you want to turn now? Now it's too late. You had transgressed all along and you were from amongst those who were corrupt, those who were sinners and so on. And you want to, trans you want to turn now when it's too late? So we need to know, nobody knows when they will expire. When they will end. That itself should help us maintain the balance. Inna Allah Ta'ala yaqbilu tawbata al-abdi ma lam yugharghir. The hadith says Allah accepts the tawbah of a worshipper, the repentance of a worshipper. For as long as they have not arrived at the point of gharghara. And gharghara is a certain point where the soul is being removed from the body. At that point it's too late. So this is also the balance we need. And this is why I say continue. Even the brothers, we all have Bad habits. Some of these bad habits are minor. Some of them are major. We need to work on them, myself included. We are all human beings. And we need to work to eradicate the bad habits and to increase the good. In the same way we have bad habits that need eradication, we have good that needs to be increased. And I feel sometimes it's more of a seesaw situation where the more you have Allah, the less you will have shaitan. And the more you have shaitan, the less you will have Allah. If a person obeys shaitan for that amount, the law of Allah is displaced from their scale. And when you eradicate shaitan from the system, 
naturally you have more of the obedience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that balance. And may He make us from amongst those who understand. When I say a seesaw relation, naturally, I am not saying we need to obey shaitan equally. But what I am saying is in the same way we have negativities that need to be eradicated, we have positives that need to be increased. Because the more you increase your positive, the more inshallah the negative will decrease. Allah open our doors. Subhanallah. Then we have the hadith, the famous hadith of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu with Abu Darda radiallahu anhu when they were made brothers in what was known as mu'akha. There are several terms that are used to describe that. What happened is when the Ansar uh, were assisting the Muhajireen who had come from Makkah to Mukarramah to Medina at a specific time or during the time of Hijrah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, what he did is he twinned or he paired certain people, certain families. So each one took in another and so on. So from amongst these, there was Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda. And what happened is Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu noticed that Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was also a pious man. They were all sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was overdoing something. Was it a bad thing? No. He was overdoing a good thing. Something brilliant. Salah. You know, a third of the night, not even a third. As the night entered, he began to read his salah. And Salman looked at him and says, Go and sleep. Go back to rest. And again, until there was a portion of the night remaining, and then he was told, okay, now you can continue. In the morning, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, naturally they arrived at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he mentioned the story, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Sadaqa Salman. To what? Salman has spoken the truth. About what? He says, look Abu Darda, your wife has a right over you. Your body has a right over you. You need to strike the balance. You cannot continue doing this and ignoring your spouse. You cannot continue doing this and ignoring your health. There is a balance. This is the literal balance that Islam has come with. Literally, there is a balance. So in the same way we would like to fulfill our salah, we may not be of the level of sainthood and we are not. Where we can stand in salah all night on our feet without expecting the feet to swell up. Yes, we might have heard that this happened to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His wife Aisha radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen radiallahu anha, she asked him, why is it that you are standing so long? So long that your feet have swollen. And naturally he was a Nabi. He was on a level of his own. Afala akuna abdan shakura. According to one of the narrations, he says, Shouldn't I be from amongst those who are grateful? Because the wife says, your status is so high. You are indeed naturally from amongst those who are prophets. You are a prophet and so on. Why would you want to continue in salah? And this was the answer. However, with us, we need to strike a balance. Even when reading salah, neither should we dart as though we are chickens pecking the ground, nor should we prolong it to the degree that we face Medical problems. Yes, it's a fact. And the same applies. We have our duties towards our children, towards our family members, spouses, parents, towards our relatives. We have people we work with. We have work and so on. You find some people, they have contracted for work and then they leave without notice or they are darting from pillar to post and the time for their work is already up or should I say it is time for them to go to work and they are somewhere else that's wrong strike the balance this is why we have punctuality punctuality is also part of Islam to be punctual with the correct intentions will earn you reward amazing look at this so the Sharia has allowed us to enjoy life but within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what Islam has come with as a balance you find, subhanallah, you lead your life, the colors you wear. Obviously, there are certain things that are prohibited, we need to know. But naturally, there is nothing hard and fast. When it comes to the dress code of a woman, there is a framework. When it comes to the dress code of a man, there is a framework. Within that framework, you work, inshallah. 
Nothing says that you need to do exactly this. Everyone needs to wear a white thobe with a white kufia on the head. No. There is nothing in Islam that makes it prohibited to be wearing other clothing that falls within the limits of Islam. And this is what we need to know. And naturally, a person's own spirituality, this was the point I was making earlier about pious people on one hand, you have a person's own spirituality developing as time passes and within their secular freedom, they will then be able to progress as well. What do I mean? I'd like to take an example from the burqa banning in France, for example. And someone asked me a few days ago, what is your opinion? Now, naturally, there are lots of opinions flying around. It's not my opinion. I want to say a fact from a secular point of view, not from a religious point of view. A fact from a secular point of view, from the French law point of view before the ban, going back to constitutional issues. Secularly, there is freedom enshrined in the law, freedom of all sorts, so much that man marry, men marry men. That's how free the secular life of France is. So there is freedom. When you force in France a gay to marry a woman, you could be jailed, naturally, you will be. You'll be penalized. Why? It's the issue of forcing. You force someone to do something against their will. So naturally, in the same way that secularly, I'm not talking of Islamically, secularly it is considered a sin to force someone to don the niqab or the hijab, it would, according to the same law, be oppression or wrong for, for someone to force a, a person who would like to don the niqab or hijab to remove it. Common sense. Common sense. But because there is no balance and because these are laws that are man-made, the balance actually tilts. We need to know we are gifted as Muslimin to have the Quran to resolve the matter and solve the problem. Subhanallah. Even when it comes to the kuffar living in Muslim lands, they have laws that govern them. They do certain things in their own Meaning without getting out in public, they have certain laws that govern that as well. Subhanallah, when it comes to Muslimin, it's amazing. It's amazing how on one hand we have people bombarding and on the other hand we have Muslims sometimes who don't want to turn to Islam. And this is why it is my call really for every one of us to educate ourselves. Without knowledge, we won't be able to strike a balance. We need to educate ourselves regarding or with the pristine, pure teachings of Islam. The purer we get, the more balanced we will be. And when we say pure, we're speaking of that Islam that was understood by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that Islam that was taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take a look at his life, how he spoke to the Jews, how he spoke to the Christians, how he spoke to the others, how he dealt with those who required a slight bit of harshness. When he spoke, how he dealt with certain people, what was the limit and the line and so on. Amazing. With us, sometimes we don't even know the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we complain that, you know what? There's no balance in Islam. There's no balance. And I've heard these complaints coming from certain people. Remember, sometimes the media plays a big role in disturbing the balance. When we don't understand another point, that the Quran has made mention of and that is to authenticate before you believe something. We need to authenticate. Not everything we hear or see on the box or the radio or what have you is correct. And if we feel that it is correct always, then what will happen? It may tilt our balance as well. Then we begin to oppress those who are innocent by statements that fly from our mouths. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Let's make mention of one or two other points in the Quran that have been spoken about regarding the balance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in Surah Al-Isra about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his spending. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبْسُطُهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا Don't be so stingy holding back your hand so tight and don't give away that which you need. Meaning you give away absolutely everything. There is a narration 
And obviously this is in Asbab al-Nuzul. It may be a weak narration, but a narration, and I'm not going to say it specifically, where it is mentioned that once the Prophet ﷺ gave away something he really needed. And the verse was revealed to say, hang on, neither should you be stingy, holding back, nor should you give away that which you need, but choose the middle path. The same applies to Luqman alayhi salatu was salam advising his child. He tells his child as well, look, you know, we as Muslimin, we need to pray. The prayer at the time of Luqman was different. But still he says, oh my son, remember your salah, remember your prayer. And then he says, when you walk, be balanced. Don't be haughty. Don't be arrogant. Yes, be balanced in your walk so that you are a moderate, humble person. And at the same time in your voice, don't raise it so much and don't drop it so that people cannot hear what you want to say when you want to communicate to them. And this is the example of the Prophet ﷺ, balance in everything. When he spoke to two or three, he spoke in such a way that the volume that came out was exactly what was needed. When he spoke to larger armies, we find a hadith where it says, إِحْمَرَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ وَعَلَى صَوْتُهُ وَاشْتَدَّ غَضَبُهُ كَأَنَّهُ مُنْذِرُ جَيْشٍ يَقُولُ صَبَّحَكُمْ وَمَسَّاكُمْ According to the narration, he used to raise his voice at certain times when it was required. And he used to utter words which were very direct. Like for example, and this is a point that I'd noted, when we want to tell our children not to make noise, when they're making a big noise, and we have important guests, it would be foolish for us to close our ears and say, shut up! Naturally, it's foolish for us to do that. Because we would make a fool of ourselves, we might get the message across, and this, there would be dead silence. But that's not a balance. You've now set a trend, you've set a norm. Every time you want something, you're going to scream for it. No. On the other hand, you don't just leave them, literally to disrespect your guest, and to run around, no, they're only children, it's fine, they're only children. They need to be told, and this is just one example I'm going to give, but you can fit it in any part of your life. They need to be told with the most effective method that it is neither too harsh nor is it such that the message doesn't get across. So you need to be quite direct and polite. Firm but polite in the most beautiful, respectable manner. Sometimes it's just the eye, the frown that does, does it. I think the sisters are understanding that because the mothers know exactly what that means. You know when you looked at with an eye and the child is shaking, Allah safeguard us. We hope that that's not the relation we have in our homes. We hope it's more balanced than that. But the child needs to feel the most loved by the parent. And at the same time, the child needs to have that slight element of fear in that the child must not do something that is outrightly wrong. Why do we say feel most loved? Sometimes people don't know what love is all about. Love is about striking a balance. You love your children and it's because of that love that you reprimand them. Look at the balance. But some of us, I love my child. So you, we throw all the money, we throw parties for them. MashaAllah, 18th birthday, they've got their vehicle and we've done this for them and we, you know, throw up maybe a holiday to Hawaii and Honolulu and so on. SubhanAllah. We're not saying don't spoil your children, but let them earn it. So that they realize the value of it. So that the day they get married and they cannot afford that anymore, they, they are not spoiled to the degree that the marriage doesn't work. Allahu Akbar. All this is foresight. We need to look ahead and think. That also is part of the balance. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really to open our doors. I still have quite a few points. And naturally the time, it's better for us to have run out of time than subhanallah. To have been so bored that everyone began to yawn and so on. That also is a balance, inshallah. Uh, I'd like to also end on an, another note. Today we have technology. Technology, my beloved brothers and sisters, is something extremely important. Personally, I have changed my views several times regarding various issues in technology. I give you the example of Facebook. I always believed it was a waste of time. And I still do to a certain extent. If it depends how you use it. And it's broken so many marriages being a counselor. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I have not been able to help in some cases. And we've been able to assist by the will of Allah in some other cases. And you have Twitter, the internet at large. 
if we do not strike the balance and set limits and times, we will destroy our lives. Remember that. The most irritating thing a spouse can ever see is the husband or wife so fascinated with the phone that click, 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 click. Click, 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 click. This is exactly what I'm going to say. It's a fact. Click, 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 click. Two in the morning. Beep, beep. Then click, 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 click. Wallahi, that is not permissible. As a Muslim, that's not striking the balance. And I've touched the button. I'm sure I have for a lot of people. Pressed it, in fact. Because then we're not good Muslim in. Remember, your time to sleep, switch it off, deal with it tomorrow morning. Today I met a brother at Muir Street. He told me, but I've emailed you. You haven't responded. I said, look, brother, I respond the first five, six emails. After that, I also have other issues. I'm not living in order to reply emails all day and all night. Wallahi, we need to strike the balance. So what should I do? I said, well, look, there are other ways of getting hold of me, number one. Number two is make use of other ulama as well. Number three is if you really have to send the mail a few times, twice, thrice. Inshallah, there's a greater possibility of it being seen. <laughs> And I'm not, I told him with all due respect, but wallahi, if we are to be enslaved by that, we won't have time for our children who are right there, right there next to us saying, Dad, but Dad, and you're saying, yeah, hang on, yeah. and you just hang on. Wallahi, it is farad for you to look at your son, switch everything off and say, yes, my son, I'm here for you today. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. I could have gone further on the point of technology, but we can use it for the benefit of the ummah or for its detriment. For our benefit or for our detriment. It's up to us to strike a balance, even in da'wah. We as those who would like to call others and to remind ourselves about Islam, there are limits. Sometimes people would require your presence 24-7. No, you should have the... Really, you should strike the balance where you need to know, brother... I need a break here. I need to attend to my farad. I need to attend to my own family. What's the point of trying to harness the whole world when my family dislikes me totally because I don't even have a minute for them to smile at them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And this is why I say with anything to do with the internet especially and your mobile phones, please draw the line. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the balance. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammadin wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.